my wife and I were listening to Nancy yesterday, Nancy Cohen. Yeah. One of her messages. <clears throat> and she says, um, we're headed for a great tribulation. A great tribulation is coming, and we're coming into a thousand year reign. Mm. So like that. And uh, what are your thoughts? I know, I know what you said in some of your <clears throat> videos, and I agree yeah. with you, but you may have heard something different, or maybe God spoke to you about something different. All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, personally, I don't believe in a great tribulation as in a fulfillment of Matthew 24. I believe Matthew 24 has already been fulfilled within the generation that Jesus said it would be, and he gave all the signs to that. Um, and I think that's that has been fulfilled in the tribulation was talking to the Jewish people who would enter into a tribulation that would end their system, their, their world, their covenant system would have come to an end. And it did in AD 70, um, the thousand year reign, which is only ever mentioned in Revelation in a couple of top places is, you know, it's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. I don't believe that's a literal thousand years. When you read the passage, the passage is extremely figurative. Um, and it talks about, you know, a dragon with chains and all this stuff. You know, no one takes that literally. So why is the thousand years literal? Because it's been conditioned within a system called dispensationalism. And, um, you know, I love Nancy and, you know, Nancy's, totally entitled to her opinion obviously um my view is that the thousand years was a period of time which was the fulfillment a hundred hundreds a time of fulfillment which again led up to the end of the old covenant age and therefore it's nothing to do with about a future years now the millennium as it's known and there are different views of when that millennium would take place or if it would take place some would say it's future and only will happen after Jesus comes for the rapture. Now, Nancy didn't mention a rapture, I'm sure, because I don't think she believes in a rapture. But but tribulation means trouble. Now, do I believe there could be some trouble ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Trouble for the systems yeah. that are not kingdom based. So the shaking of those systems will lead to those systems failing and falling and people leaving those systems and seeking a better system, if you like, a kingdom of God, hopefully. So I've no problem with tribulation per se and that things could happen that could be seen as tribulation, but it's not tribulation as in has been taught by premillennialists and by dispensationalists that take it from Matthew 24 and then apply it before Jesus is coming. And they would say there's seven years tribulation. And some people would say, oh, Jesus comes before the tribulation, pre-trib rapture. Some would say mid-trib rapture. And others would say post-trib rapture. But I don't believe in any rapture in, you know, Jesus coming to take the church away. And I don't believe that the thousand years after that rapture which jesus never mentioned and that even revelation doesn't mention in terms of anything to do with a rapture or even to do with a tribulation although the book of revelation is about the tribulation it is what's going on in the tribulation that comes to end the old temple system because the temple's still standing in the book of revelation and obviously it comes to a complete destruction as jesus said it would the teaching about the rapture the teaching about the millennium as a future period and the teaching about zionism as about jesus coming back to jerusalem to set up an earthly kingdom for an earthly people the jewish people is completely coming from a false teaching based in depth in brethrenism that produced dispensationism that spread through the Schofield Bible notes and then became part of mostly in U.S. seminaries, was taught to missionaries who then spread that all over the world. Very, very um, clever strategy of the enemy to sow deception out into the world. And 
to completely remove the concept of the kingdom of God being established through us rather than the kingdom of God being established through Jesus coming to set up an earthly kingdom. And the extreme forms of dispensationalism will even talk about Jesus setting up a new temple with with animal sacrifices, which will be like, why on earth do we need animal sacrifices when we've clearly got the one sacrifice for all time, Jesus? So it's a mixture of various cherry pip scriptures out of the Bible, trying to put it together in a system that actually nowhere exists. Nowhere in the Bible does it say there are seven dispensations, each of a thousand years. And now we're coming to the end of the 6,000 years. Or some people will say, well, we're into the seven. The world has not just been around for 6,000 years. Yeah. At the end of the day, I do not believe in a literal 6,000 year old world. You know, it probably is 13.4 billion years old, but... That being said, time is relative to the speed of light. And if the speed of light was faster in the past, relatively, you know, we could be six days, but not six days as we know them. But I do not believe the Bible anywhere talks about seven dispensations. It does talk about covenants. There's a covenant with Adam. There's a covenant with Noah. There's a covenant with Abraham. There's a covenant with Moses. There's a covenant with David. So there are agreements God made, which Jesus came to fulfill. So those covenants are fulfilled in it, him. They're not yet to be fulfilled in some other time. So dispensationalism created a false narrative about the future which produced a be, we're going to be rescued by Jesus and the church is going to be taken out of the world and then the tribulation will happen and then Jesus will come and rescue the Jewish people because it's all centered around the Jewish people are all going to be attacked by everyone else you know and therefore Jesus is going to come and rescue them Paul made it clear who the true Jew was that person who'd been circumcised in his heart in other words a believer and follower of jesus was the true jew because it's not to do with ethnicity it's to do with a heart relationship with god and of course we wouldn't call ourselves jews today because we're not living in the first century in the context of this persecution that they were facing under judaism and rome and everything else so Paul, when he said, well, here's the Israel of God, was being provocative, deliberately provocative. He was a ethnic Jew and he was a Pharisee. And he said all of that was done, basically, counted for nothing. Now he is in Christ. And he wanted them to see that they're no longer ob obligation to any laws to which they were never under obligation in the first place. Nowhere, anywhere does it say that the Gentiles were to be subject to the law. But again, extreme versions of dispensationalism, which would come about in a term called theonomy, would be re-establishing the law so that those who are, who are remaining on earth would have to come under the law. Well, that's an antithesis of Paul's teaching and Jesus's teaching in which was to come and follow him, you know, not follow another system. So, you know, I don't believe in a literal thousand years. I don't believe in any thousand years. I, you know, there are views of premillennial. So Jesus is going to come back and then there will be a thousand years. There's a view of postmillennial. You know, we're in the thousand years and when the kingdom of God's filled the earth, Jesus will come. And there are those who are amillennial who don't really believe it's a literal thousand years, but the period that we're in. I believe it's the period that's already happened. And it brought to end the old, and now we're in the new. So all of the birth pangs, the tribulation of the end of the old system, are also the beginning of the new. And we have that in a birth. You know, there's pain in childbirth, and then you get a birth and a new life. It's like you don't focus on the end 
of the pregnancy, you focus on the beginning of the baby's life. And the same with Jesus said, look, there's lots of signs coming to, to the end. These are birth pangs of the new, which was to come. You know, so unfortunately, there's such a mixture that still pervades the church in these areas where some people like Ian Clayton totally rejects the rapture. But he accepts Zionism and he accepts the millennium. But they come from the same poisonous tree, the roots of that same poisonous tree, because they've not been yet deconstructed, I believe, in those areas of eschatology. So they're this revelation, but they've not had that revelation. And I think it's the same with others. They're still coming out of a programmed and conditioning of an old belief system which is dispensationalism which was very prevalent among pentecostals and charismatics you know it also included cessationalism which was the, the ending of spiritual gifts um and you know of course charismatics and pentecostals believe in spiritual gifts so they reject that aspect of dispensationalism but they still keep on some of the aspects. And I think you can get a, into a system of, well, there's 6,000 years, then the seventh, and you've got, oh, we're entering into a period of rest. And, and all of these things, you know, you can understand where the symbolism comes from, but it's not literal. It's about spiritual rest. It's not talking about a kingdom that Jesus comes to establish on earth. We are to see the kingdom of God fill the earth. As leaven leavens the whole lump. It's not about Jesus coming to establish it. And it's not about Jesus coming to establish it in Jerusalem, in Israel, with a Jewish nation that are called the people of God. Because Peter made it very clear that those who were not the people of God are now called the people of God because it's nothing to do with ethnicity or religion. It's about faith in christ and following jesus that you would be classed as part of the people of god and even in the old covenant it was still nothing to do with following the law because righteousness does not come through the law it was those who were following god abraham it was counted to him as righteous that was even before the law so the law would never produce righteousness so why do we think it would produce righteousness again in the future? And, you know, I think Paul makes it really clear that there aren't two peoples. There's one new man in Christ, according to Ephesians, which are Jews and Gentiles, which are now one new man in Christ. Because he also said there is no Jew, there is no Gentile. We shouldn't be differentiating people on their origin. But looking at them in their union of being part of god's family whether they come from whatever they could be muslims they could be hindus they could be pagans they could be anything but they've come to the relationship with god and are now part of the one people family of god now from one perspective the whole world is god's family it's just most of them don't know that yet so Paul talks about that all have been reconciled, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos to himself, not counting any of their trespasses or sins against them. So God has nothing against anybody, including Jesus came to take away the sin of who? The Jews? Some people? No, the world. You know, and that world world is different from other worlds in worlds so you've got different translations of world cosmos and some people translate anios world but that isn't world it's a period of time you know um so we've got lots of confusion around it all and i think there's still a lot of deconstruction to go to get dispensationalism out of people so that they don't mix all this stuff up and they don't look at Matthew 24 and think, oh, there's a great tribulation coming. You know, actually, no, it came. 
and it fulfilled what that trouble was the trouble of israel on the day of the lord um and literally the whole system was judged and found obviously obsolete and faded away yeah. so no i don't believe in any of that uh, and i think if you have a consistent understanding of what god has done through history leading up to what jesus did and then beyond you don't need to come up with these man-made fabricated systems you know nowhere in the bible does it say that there was the age of innocence the age of conscience the age of law the age of kingdom the age of this that and the other the age of church the millennial age it doesn't say that anywhere so this system has been developed by cherry picking little things and putting together as if this is a consistent whole and all of those people who wrote books around this stuff if you push them they would admit that they've taken this bible verse to prove their point and actually the context that those bible verses were taken out of have nothing to do with what they purport them to say because there is no system there is no biblical system that says that you know and even those who believe in covenant theology they're still coming up with a system of belief that takes the covenants that god did make with man and try and put them into a system rather than seeing we're looking for the fulfillment of all those promises that came through jesus who is the fulfillment of all the promises of god and he is the true israel of god yeah you know, he is the fulfillment and we are now all in him we didn't make a covenant with god called the new covenant jesus made the covenant with the father to include all of us in its benefits to which jesus will never break it therefore it is absolutely secure whereas all the other covenants were basically based on man's keeping their side of it and when man didn't keep their side of it or israel didn't keep their side of it god divorced israel so well, well how can they suddenly be back in well true the people who are rabbis there's a whole group who do not believe that israel is from god and they're totally anti-zionist they're called is jews against israel in that they believe that this is a political system set up by political zionists for their own agenda and it's nothing to do with biblical restoration to which they say can only be formed through the messiah but they're still looking for an earthly messiah when obviously we've had a heavenly messiah jesus the christ already come so they're still looking for something future which is already past and if they actually saw jesus was the fulfillment as the messiah they wouldn't be looking for a future fulfillment either they would see it's already available to them so their restoration back into the people of god so they don't believe they're entitled to the land because of they were divorced from the land and the the promises that god made because they were unfaithful to god and that's their view of it they see that they could never become faithful until the messiah comes to include them whereas jesus has included them and all jewish people muslim people hindu people any other form of religious people are all included in what jesus did on the cross and included in the new covenant in christ they're just following their own religious ideas of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not accepting the free gift of grace that comes through jesus so they're still working at it to find some way of getting back to god through the works of their religion where jesus has said the work it is finished it's done deal you are included so i don't believe these things are helpful because what it does it, it creates still the well if there's a kingdom coming who's going to do it us jesus why is it only a thousand years you know 
So there's so many questions that it promotes. Why? Why do we even need any of that? It just says that the kingdom of God will fill the earth. You know, and so why do we need a thousand years for Jesus to come and do it? You know, so unfortunately, whenever stuff starts to happen in Israel, like war or anything else, all of the futurists come out of the woodwork and they all start talking about Armageddon and Jesus coming back and they promote war. They're not peacemakers. They're not looking for peace in the Middle East because peace does not fulfill their theological expectations. War does. And Jesus clearly called us to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, not warmongers. And I think hyper futurists are promoting war. They support Israel in destroying the pa Palestinians because they know that will produce a wider war in which then they see Armageddon and Jesus having to come to rescue Israel for all the world will come against them because that's their theological position. But ultimately, I don't believe any of that's true. And I believe that everything the Bible has promised is all fulfilled in Christ. And therefore, we are in the period in which that is being established. There is no need for future prophecy. We're in it already. You know, um, so, yes, it's it's uh, it's under uh, confusing when people from the same sort of mystical stream come out with very different theological perspectives on eschatology you know and i've been in meetings where i've totally explained eschatology and nancy's been in those meetings it just has not challenged her old thinking in that area and she still operates out of an old mindset i believe but you know she's entitled to that opinion <laughs> you know i'm i'm not gonna say she can't have that opinion but ultimately, I don't think it's helping people because they what if there's a tribulation coming, what does that produce? Fear. You know, God is not the author of fear or confusion or chaos. So he wants us to be in peace. You know, so, yes, unfortunately, there are lots of different viewpoints out there. But I think more and more people are beginning to come to a realization, particularly amongst the Grace Awakening Network and those who are really starting to embrace inclusion, that these theological positions are old, undeconstructed mindsets which are conditioned within the evangelical church um, and need deconstruction. You know, because they lead to the same conclusion as hell and other things, which Nancy wouldn't agree with because she totally believes in the restoration of all things. So if we're in the period of restoration of all things, why are we expecting a thousand year reign? We just need to see the rest restoration of all things fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think deconstruction <laughs> is definitely the thing that we we all need and especially coming from a religious perspective hmm. now when we heard nancy say that we felt uncomfortable but we knew that wasn't true and i think we knew that because the holy spirit was saying no that's already happened but will we have, have some tribulation maybe especially here in the u.s but not in the sense of um as in matthew 24 <clears throat> So I totally agree. I think the greatest problems um, people have, especially in marriages, is that there really needs to be that deconstruction and sonship in the relationship. And I think that's what God's been working with us on. Yeah, which totally. is great. You know, and unfortunately, deconstruction doesn't necessarily happen all at the same time with all of the same people in all of the same way. So some people can be deconstructed in some things and not others. Therefore, it's like, well, how can they possibly believe that? Because they've not yet been deconstructed. How could I possibly have believed all that in the past? Because I did. 
because I was programmed into believing that this was the truth. And God had to deconstruct me. I couldn't deconstruct myself. And, you know, because we do have confirmational bias, which makes it harder to reject the things that we once believed. And some of these things are quite strongly deceptions. You know, I do believe they are doct doctrinal, demonic doctrines designed to deceive people into letting go of their sonship and asking for rescue. Ultimately, you know, it's like we are responsible for seeing creation restored. It doesn't say creation is longing and waiting for Jesus to come back and do it. It's waiting for us, longing and waiting for us to be revealed in our sonship. And that's not going to happen in some thousand years in the future. It is happening now. It's here and now, you know, and for a lot of people, they've rejected affecting the world because they want to be rescued. So they don't believe they could fulfill seeing the kingdom of God fill the earth. So they're waiting for Jesus to come and do it for them. Which is, you know, taking away our responsibility as sons of God to establish it on earth as it is in heaven. You know, but I'm not without hope that restoration will continue. And I think something like the Grace Awakening Network which encompasses so many different people from so many different backgrounds, Baxter Kruger and Francoise de Toit and John Crowder. I mean, they're all strange bedfellows for a start. But ultimately, they're all actually moving in this one river because they've come from different streams. You know, and I, I am very positive about that because I was prophesying that that would happen four or five years ago that these many rivers would come together. And the Grace Awakening Network has streams of eschatology, inclusion, all coming together in this grace awakening, you know, and love awakening to which I am truly blessed, you know, to see it beginning to happen and spread and increase, you know, and that actually is a shaking of the religious system when you start to see truth and light come forth, which brings into question so many things that people used to believe. That's an awakening. Now that is a shaking of the religious systems. Deconstruction is a shaking of the religious systems that we believe. So you could see that as a shaking. Now I know we have a sort of perception of shaking in a particular way, but we need our understanding broadened so that we can see it, me being deconstructed is a shaking of that which is not based on God's kingdom in me. And broadly in the church as well, as more and more people awaken to the fact that God isn't, you know, operating in penal punishment and all of those things. You know, so it's a very positive outlook for me, but not a triumphalist one. In the, oh, it's all wonderful. No, we are going to have to see things shaken and changed in me, around us. But we have something which is immovable and unshakable. A foundation which is Jesus. And if we lay a, have a foundation laid which was Jesus, that whatever the storms of life are, they won't actually see our life collapse. That's what I believe we need to focus on on what Jesus has done and making sure we have that established in our lives and we won't be shaken you know because it won't cannot be shaken that's what it says in Hebrews the kingdom cannot be shaken so any belief system which isn't of God's kingdom can be shaken and that could be seen as a deconstruction or a tribulation you know because in Acts it says about you know the kingdom of God comes through many tribulations. Yeah, well, that is not a period as in a prophetic act, Matthew 24, but it is a series of things which will challenge our beliefs. And of course, all the Jews that became followers of Jesus went through a deconstruction. And for some of them, 
it didn't wasn't a full deconstruction because they were still trying to get people back under the law follow jesus but yeah but still follow the law of moses as well yeah well actually no that needed deconstructing now i would say a tribulation for someone like peter was going to see cornelius and seeing the holy spirit fall on him and having a vision in which all these unclean animals fall down in a sheet and god says eat them which was basically saying all of these barriers that you saw in place are removed i've not come from just you jewish people i've come for the whole world now that was a massive shaking and tribulation for peter that he had to go through that changed the whole course of history because if they had not accepted gentiles into the family of god then it would still be a jewish religion only based around israel but there jesus said go into the ends of the earth and spread this but they couldn't spread a mixture of well we're gonna have a bit of law and a bit of grace it had to be all grace and no law yes uh, mike uh, restoration of all things yeah. and i think all is all and we clearly are entering that period. And I think the tribulation will be as some of these systems are restored, reset, transformed into something new. It won't be like it was. So it, will, it may feel like a tribulation as it's perfected. And isn't Jesus restoration of all things? Hmm. Yeah. You know, he, he yeah. brings um, so... If you are if you are a member of Morning Star Ministry yeah. in the U.S. and everybody's looking to this prophet named Chris Reed, yeah. and then now he's resigned, it's mm. going to feel like tribulation. Of course, it is. Yeah, it'll remind us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Yeah. Unfortunately, people want someone to follow rather than following Jesus themselves. So there is this sort of raising people up and placing them on a pedestal as a leader that we're going to follow. And uh, those leaders ultimately are not perfect and will make mistakes in their lives. And, you know, I mean, I don't know Chris Reed personally. I know that he was responsible for inviting Justin Abraham, I think, to Morningstar, and that didn't end well. And I think ultimately when Rick Joyner stood down, there was a potential for Chris Reed to, because he was a restoration of all things believer, I, I, I've been told, and he was operating in a mystical way and wanted to lead the church that way and to lead their ministry that way. The enemy has effectively give, put in temptation in, in the place now, what it shows me is in all these things, hey, we should have grace, mercy and love for those people who have made mistakes. Have we not all made mistakes? Have we not all done things that we would like to take back and not do? But because they're put up into this elevated position, there's a, there is a sense where it's a long way to fall. And people then sort of undermine probably everything that they have done and believed. And I do believe that Chris Reed also had a vision of John in a cave saying that he's still alive and he would may come back into public display. Now, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and reject everything that he stood for, because I'm sure he had revelation and had experienced lots of things. But what it is an indication within anyone who actually has a need internally that's not met in god there is a there is an openness to find that need in something else so we all have inner needs that god wants to can fully fulfill and meet and if we don't have a level of intimacy with god as father that gives us our sonship then we may still look for those things externally in affirmation from other people and obviously if you're a male that could lead you to find an affirmation in another female you know now that is an area that even those who have 
wonderful wisdom like Solomon ended up with a thousand concubines. It's like something was amiss there. Well, because he did not fully know his identity in Christ. And we're all subject to that. And none of us should point the finger or cast stones at those who have struggles in these areas, because all of us have been through struggles of various sorts. And what we need to do is to help everyone find a restored place within God's heart so that they can find their needs met in God. You know, now, ultimately, I believe that Chris Reed had an opportunity to bring Morningstar into a position of following Jesus into a heavenly realms, mystical place. And now that has been undone. You know, and now you probably got Rick Joyner stepping back in, who's coming back with the old. You know, and oft, often it is the eschatological, which is the issue, which is certainly what happened when you preach happy eschatology. Someone like Rick Joyner is not very happy with you. So you end up again facing the same thing. Oh, the tribulation and the thousand years and the civil war in America and California falling into sea with God's judgment. All of those things which are coming out of a wrong understanding of the nature and character and love of God. God is good. God is not going to destroy California. He's not going to do those negative things. And he's already judged the earth and found us all innocent. So God gives opportunities for us to embrace what he's doing. And if we don't embrace what he's doing, you find that people will start to be drawn towards God and will start to leave that system. And some people will find deconstruction. Which will deconstruct their faith. Through looking at a man and being disillusioned and hurt by his fall and betrayal. And then they reject God and what God is doing on the basis of what a man's done. And we have that all over. Same thing with others like Jonathan Welton and other people like that. You know, I know of people who, who were working for him and got disillusioned and almost, you know, went away from God altogether. Deconstruction is something that God does in us through relationship not that we're deconstructed because of some event or failure of someone within the church and that deconstruction is based in unforgiveness not in what god is doing in true deconstruction we reject god because of people and i don't and i think there's always a risk and that's what we should legislate for around these situations whether it be IHOP or other places that things have come to light and all these stuff, let's have grace and mercy for those people. Now, ultimately, you want those people to own what happened and to acknowledge it and therefore to see and find healing and wholeness within it. You know, and not just hide away or, or trying to ignore it or deny it. But ultimately, what did David do? You know, and what did God say of David? God was, he was a man after God's own heart. That didn't excuse what he did. There were consequences of what he did from an earthly perspective, but not from God. God didn't kill his son, you know, to punish him. But it was a consequence of the trial and turmoil that was created through the frequency of what happened through that event that probably created a dynamic for sickness to come on his child. You know, but God didn't do that. And we should not in any way see God's judgment on people who fall in a negative way rather than, no, God still loves that person and has still judged them innocent and has already forgiven them. But we need to see them restored. Not just back to where they were, but back to what God intends for them, which will be wholeness. No one does those things unless there's a degree of brokenness within their heart somewhere. There's a need that's not being met somewhere. And God wants to meet those needs. But let's be merciful and supportive 
and bear one another's burdens rather than criticizing and judging and coming against. You know, because I think ultimately none of us can look at our lives and say that we've never ever done something we're we're ashamed of, not ashamed of. Yeah, you because know, we all have. You know, we've all failed at different things. Now, praise God that He's merciful and that He loves us and He's restored us. But ultimately, all of us, you know, have our own issues that God wants us to find all of the resolution of those issues in Him and be finding the love and acceptance and affirmation in Him rather than in people and in other things. You know, so, you know, I. I always feel this is a time when you're going to get people coming out with negative judgments and everything like that. And we need to try and protect someone from the outworking of that so that God can work in their lives and they're not feeling under condemnation and from guilt and shame because that isn't coming from God. There's acknowledgement and acceptance, but that means forgiveness you know, that God has forgiven, and so should we. Therefore, we shouldn't hold these things against people. You know, but it does have ripples, and it could be seen as a shaking of that particular system. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people within that system who need God's help and mercy and grace right now, because they will be feeling betrayed or hurt or confused and they're un not understanding what's going on and why did this happen and all of the questions that all come out of things like that and i've been through this myself in that people around me have done things which have caused people to question everything and question what going on you know and uh, but what can we do other than forgive them now, the consequence might be that they can't stay in the present position and continue doing what they're doing until they find a place of restoration. And for some people, they never find that place because they either run or they leave and don't work through the issues. And there are a number of big ministries who have not worked through the issues and therefore the issues have repeated themselves. But then look back and you see the prophetic movement and you see all of the things. I mean, I remember reading the book God's Generals about, you know, the healing revivals of the 40s, 50s, 60s. And, oh, God, they were so immature. All squabbling over who had the biggest tent, who had the biggest audience, who had the biggest this. You know, and actually, hey, did God still use them? Yes, he did. Despite their immaturity, God still used them. But he didn't excuse their immaturity. You know, and you look back and think, oh heck why why were they like that because they didn't have relationship with people and with god that set them free from that that they helped them to and unfortunately when you put people and raise them up and you then almost see them as between you and god then they're above you and people find it very difficult to be honest and challenging to those who are quote above them therefore accountability some people find it difficult and people who should be holding people accountable for their relationship with god and each other and have a friendship with people where we can be open and honest and talk through our issues to help us deal with look if he if this guy had basically had a friend who he could confide in confidentially and say look i'm struggling with some negative thoughts here but i would imagine that he never was able to do that and therefore those thoughts developed into something more than thoughts and then action but if he would caught them as thoughts and shared that with someone that he knew he could trust then he would have probably dealt with why he had the thoughts in the process of restoration at that point and never gone forward into the place he is now and unfortunately, a lot of leaders position themselves in such a place that they don't have that level of relationship with people in which they trust them. And they're then afraid to be honest and open. Because they think it will be used against them. So they keep it all hidden 
struggling internally because imagine someone like that didn't just do something out of the blue this must have built he must have felt on the inside condemned he must have felt guilty he must have felt this over and over it's, it's very rare that people just go and do things and it's like oh well i don't really care i'm sure he doesn't feel that way or did feel that way all the way through but it happens but God still loves that person. And let's stop putting people, you know, I'm not saying only in America, but it, Americans seem to like charismatic big figures that they can look to, to lead them. You know, and a lot of the prophetic movement prophesied the end of these structures. You know, the Kansas City prophets, John Paul Jackson, others, prophesied the end of structures of hierarchy within the church but they failed to embrace that in their own lives and ministries so they ended up for being a self-fulfilling prophecy unfortunately when you look back in the history and you see god will give an opportunity to change and he gives that opportunity to embrace what he's doing and when you embrace it, you change. If you resist it, it starts to put pressure on. And ultimately, you end up following your own understanding rather than following what God is saying. Because it's too challenging to change this system that you developed in your own ministry where you are at the top of the ministry pile. And it's very hard for people. You know, I had to let go of things. You know, when I was in a position where God was going to use me, I had to be willing to say, I'm handing this over. This is not mine. This is God's. Therefore, I don't need the leadership of this anymore. I'm going to give it to other people to lead this. You know, and I had to face those things. You plant something, you start something, you know, you are the founder of something. Then it's like, OK, I'm giving this to someone else. But that's the problem. Some people stay on in positions that they should have left and, and moved on and given other people the opportunity to take things further. You know, you've got to be willing to realize this is not about me or any individual. This is about God and his kingdom. You know, and if our position is coming from and our identity is coming from what we do. Then it will be hard to let go of what we've developed and a lot of people i mean i i prophesied years ago when i was looking at the joshua generation that many ministers had built their ministries in the wilderness and god was calling us to cross over into a new whole revelation of church and a new wineskin and that those who had built their things and their security was in their ministry and their finances was in their ministry but their ministry was a wilderness ministry and was never intended god did not say build anything in the wilderness it, it was to establish it in the promised land and ultimately a lot of ministries have collapsed a lot of people have ended up losing those positions anyway because they rejected giving them up and changing and embracing the change that was coming which is relational non-hierarchical ministry and leadership leadership that serves does not overshadow or oversee or cover people because as soon as you create a covering for people people have to go to you and then when those people collapse or fall people are disillusioned and sadly that's what happens when these things take place and I'm sure a lot of people are struggling right now and we should, you know, be merciful and gracious to those people because they are probably struggling with what's gone on and why has it gone on and how did it go on? And, you know, all of those questions that come up at a time like this, why didn't we see this? You know, and sometimes it's like, I don't know why God didn't show it, but he doesn't always. You know, we had in ministry and part of our leadership team years ago, two people who were in an, an illicit relationship for years. 
that no one ever knew until it came into the light. Then it's like, well, why didn't we see that all the way through? Well, some of it is, you know, you always want to think the best of people. So you don't want to be thinking the worst of people. But why didn't God just tell us? I mean, I was in an intimate relationship with God in which he was giving me stuff to talk about all day, every day. So why didn't he tell me that this person was in this relationship wrongly with another person? He didn't. Now, maybe because he wanted those people or was asking those people to open up and share and ask for forgiveness without being exposed. So that the responsibility was theirs. And eventually this one of these two people, they came clean because they couldn't cope with it anymore. And so they then asked for forgiveness and were restored and everything else and received love and acceptance and weren't exposed to shame and everything else. But you sort of think, I think, well, well, God could have told me that five years ago and we would have stopped it happening. But actually, God isn't going to take away our choice. And I, you know, when I look at prophetic stuff, Whenever I was involved with prophetic ministries and people would be prophesying, I I wanted them to prophesy what was really going on in my life and in my heart. Because I was already aware of it. You know, I knew the struggles I was going through at times. So I wanted them to be real and honest. You know, they never were. None of them ever identified anything that was going on in my life. They prophesied some really nice things. But I would rather have said, look, God has seen your heart. He knows the struggles you're going through right now, blah, blah, blah. But he didn't. None of them did. Now, I don't know whether they saw it and were afraid to say it or whatever reason. Actually, it just felt maybe that's not how God does things. Maybe God doesn't expose people, but wants people to come to the truth and open that up for themselves rather than it being exposed. You know, because God is loving and gracious. He doesn't want to bring people into exposing if it's if at all possible. But sometimes it's the only course when it comes to public knowledge. But when it does, we need to really be careful how we handle it with people. And, you know, I mean, you know, no doubt this will probably be all over Facebook. But I don't see a lot of this stuff on Facebook anymore. You know, I see the stuff I want to see you know woodworking videos and <laughs> my football club videos and other things because facebook knows the things i look at so i don't generally pick up that stuff because i really i don't want to be part of spreading this sort of stuff you know because it should be dealt with with that person in private with god and with their family or relationship or all the other things that need restoring and looking after in that situation you know it shouldn't be on facebook or in a in the public domain like like it tends to be you know because i think that's not not the way god does it you know but it is sad and you know and i you know i feel sad for people in those situations that doesn't excuse what they've done, but ultimately, you know, I know people don't do that stuff because they want to in sense of, oh, well, yeah, I want to go out and do this. It's because of some inner brokenness that drives people towards the comfort of other relationships. You know, whereas God wants to meet our needs in those areas. So Mike, you mentioned, um, <clears throat> the Joshua generation and moving into promises, there's been a lot of, I've, I've noticed a lot of um, different people talking about the door of Goshen is open and entering into the fullness of everything that is good um, and receiving the, that, what, what is your view of, of Goshen and, and kind of the, the talk of Goshen um, in the mystical area, particularly um. Uh, I think some people like to label something to give something a context. Now, are we going back to what Goshen was in 
the Old Testament. Of course we're not. We're not going to all live in an area of Israel, are we? So it's a spiritual thing that the Holy Spirit is using to highlight there's something new and fulfill that we can enter into, that God is wanting us to enter into. And therefore, yeah, the promised land, areas of the promised land, Bethel within the promised land, you know, you know, if, if Jacob had stayed at Bethel, we wouldn't have had all the stuff of going through the wilderness. He would have lived under an open heaven with the angelic presence in Bethel, the house of God. Therefore, they would have possessed the promised land before they ever went into Israel, into, into Egypt. So ultimately, it's, for me, it's, it's a metaphorical use of something which refers to a place of blessing and fulfillment and promise. And of course, God wants to bring us into that. But I wouldn't over spiritualize it and sort of tie it to anything literal in that way. You know, but, you know, the Holy Spirit can use illustrations, you know, like I use the promised land of going a crossing over Jordan, crossing over into a new thing. But you have to go through the baptisms of Jordan, if you like which could be seen as a baptism of fire or, you know, other, other illustrations, you know, they're all sort of metaphors for God doing something that leads us into a place that he always intended. You know, I wasn't talking about the promised land as, Oh, we've all got to emigrate and go and cross the Jordan. And we've got to go around the wilderness of 40 years before we do it. But figuratively, many of us have gone around the religious wilderness in our lives and discovered it's not a good place to live. You know, and yes, God has blessed us in that wilderness and he's given us water and he's given us manna from heaven and he's blessed us. But he doesn't want us to stay there or get comfortable living there because there's something more to enter into. So these are figurative things that I feel are ways of looking at the kingdom of God and the restoration of all things in that we need to see that it is more than we presently see and that God has got more. And until the kingdom of God has fully filled the earth and the glory of God is covering the earth in that way and that every last person has come into a relationship with God, then there's more to come into. But, you know, some of the terms and some of the sort of things that are said can be caught up with things that people don't understand you know and things which i think is that going to help me live my life today in a better way and some of it can be like with all movements there can be an elitist thing with it well we're the tip of the spear you know and we're the ones who are breaking through and look we're the we're the 13th tribe you know and we're the real people that god was talking about you know and all of that stuff you know i understand you know, that it can be used figuratively, but then people take it too literally. And then all of a sudden they are it. And then they're the next denomination that are now it. We are it. And so Goshen is now us. And that's what happens when, well, anyone outside of us isn't Goshen. They're only going to be fulfilled if they join us. Now, that's the problem with denominationalism. It places God's promises very clearly within a very limited stream where actually God wants every everyone to be in figuratively the fulfillment of Goshen and blessing and promise and everything. You know, not just those who believe certain things. So it's not just for mystics. In that sense, God wants to bless everybody. You know, so we've got to be careful we don't make it elitist. And only for certain people who have certain revelation. This is about God wanting to bless people. Not just blessing some special people because of what they know. You know, because that can create a in and out. You know, well, you don't belong in with us. if you, And then it, well, if you don't believe what we believe, you're not going to enter Goshen. You're not going to be part of what God is doing in these days because it's about we got we have the revelation 
you know, and actually let, let's give away everything that we've received so that everyone can have that revelation and know that truth and enter into their own personal Goshen, which may be very different from each other because God can bring us into the fulfillment in our own lives, in our own situations, even if corporately that's not yet fully fulfilled. But I'm sure there are a lot of people today living in their own personal promised land in Goshen and they're fully enjoying it. You know, even if the whole world is not yet. Um, you know. So, yeah, I don't believe it's an event or, you know, so, something that Jesus is going to do. I think it's just a process of progressively seeing the kingdom of God fill the earth like leaven through a whole lump. And eventually the whole earth will come into the knowledge of the glory of God in relationship as every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus is Lord. But not by force, but by choice and through experience. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.